Walt Disney, followed by Walt Disney, followed once again by Walt f***ing Disney. Some people watch this scene focused on the cloaked figure with a baby, but I'm highly concerned about the mailbox just hanging open like this. Close it! This is an invitation for suburban squirrels to move into the convenient high-rise apartment. Also, this absolute asshole of a parking meter that decided to manifest itself into existence without going through the proper paperwork for a permit. Also, also, maybe I'm misunderstanding how relaxin works. I mean, I've never had it course through my body and f with the flexibility of my ligaments, but if I did, I would not be tempting ankle sprain fate and wearing high heel shoes directly after childbirth. This pencil is either defying the laws of physics or Lewis has, for some reason, engineered it to counterbalance perfectly with this little of its total length behind his ear. Go on, I see you reaching for your trusty number two pencil in an attempt to disprove the mean YouTube man. Do it! I dare you! And I shall cackle over the corpses of a thousand shattered pencils whose lead shall never touch paper and whose stories shall never be written, all because you didn't trust the internet! <laughs> It's my destiny to play that game. Believing in destiny. I want to say that Goob's dark circles are due to lack of sleep or poor nutrition, but the movie doesn't do a great job of establishing the nature of his appearance. Maybe he just has dark circles under his eyes and that's fine. But if he's being neglected or abused, then this kid's film takes on a totally different tone that deserves extra sin. I have never understood the reasoning behind choosing to test an offensive item on yourself after it fails in an attempt to get it working again. Yes, it has resulted in some hilarious YouTube clips of kids getting blasted by hoses that suddenly start working, but damn it, we need to stop encouraging this sort of reckless behavior in our children. It's a damn miracle they survive Legos, let alone anything else. I hope this is it. I hope he gets adopted. Shouldn't Mildred already have a clue about the adults shopping for kids? She should ask, do you like scientifically driven children? How do you feel about a 12-year-old using a soldering iron? How many calculator batteries do you currently have in your battery drawer? If the adults were confused by any of those three questions, then Lewis should not be exposed to another rejection interview. F*** Mildred is what I'm saying. She's a horrible woman. What's the number one problem that you face when you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Stirring the oil back into my goddamn natural peanut butter, that's what. And thanks for the reminder of that annoying task. We don't usually eat peanut butter. There's an anaphylactic chasm between we don't usually eat peanut butter and holy sh**, my airways are closing quick. I'm no genius kid inventor, but I do have basic problem-solving skills. Man, I am confused by this invention. We have jelly running down the right tube and peanut butter on the left. When the two substances arrive at the conjunction point, they merge into one tube in a sick PBJ union. But then that tube connects to the rotating bi-funnel funk shooter gun, and the now-merged PB and J is somehow separated back into two separate streams. And if that isn't silly enough for you, the purple boysenberry jelly appears to now be pink strawberry. I bet you thought the B in PB and J stood for butter. It's too bad he didn't get to try a sandwich from that wonderful invention of yours. <laughs> it's, it's too bad that the man who was violently allergic to peanut butter didn't get to eat a sandwich whose ingredients are 50% peanut butter? Mildred is the villain of this movie. I am suitably impressed that this tally does in fact add up to 124. But what sort of monster alternates the angle of lines like this? No wonder nobody wants this kid. Wrong. I saw. Okay, sure, maybe Lewis opened his baby Lewis eyes and glanced up at his mother, but infants don't have 20-20 vision straight out of the womb. And sure, Lewis is a kid and may not know this fact, but he's also inventing machines that read people's f***ing memories here in a minute. So don't tell me he can't do a little research before he tries to recollect a not-so-helpful blurry blob figure. Based on the date in this shop window, we know that this movie takes place during or after 1999. So why would a movie being released at the turn of the century boast about being filmed in color? Also, foreshadowing. This montage is on for some time, and all I can think about is the lack of rules and discipline in this orphanage of chaos. Lewis is apparently allowed to skip meeting potential adopters, stay up all night inventing sh** and even operate a f***ing blowtorch. How has this place not been burnt down, shut down, or at least investigated by the CPS? Wait, better question. How the f*** did a 12-year-old get into a live brain surgery? Where is his adult supervision? Unless this movie is set in spells words oddly England, stereo is spelled incorrectly here. I have now spent more time wondering if this retail store is telling me they sell things with a permanent sale sign, or if they always have a special sale going on. And that's far too much time wondering what the dumb shop owners are doing and how to stop permanent sale signs from ever being allowed anywhere in the whole world. This book better be about a Rob Reiner or God help us. This appears to be a post-it note with hand-drawn audio waves, and my question is simply, why? Why go to the effort of providing protective headgear that doesn't protect the most vulnerably squishy parts of said head? While we're at it, why is this teacher even allowing Lewis's shenanigans if one of the possible outcomes would require the use of protective headgear? Why are the adults in this movie so terrible? 
But that's what happens when you get a science geek for a roommate. Goob's tongue is doing far too much work when he talks, and it's the most distracting thing I've seen today. This school is a school of cheaters, or at the very least, unimaginative copycats. This project is repeated here, this one over here, and this one here. And that's just for starters. Disney is even ripping itself off over here. Each patch is the equivalent of 12 cups of coffee. Lucille survives this. The wall and cave-like anatomy of this horrifying mouth. I just want to bite his chubby little cheeks! Boldly stating that you want to bite another person, especially if that person is a child. No one sees a hat flying from the rafters to the ground and sprouting metal claws. No one. And this room is filled with easily distracted children who are absolutely looking around. Sass me, boy. I know karate. Reacting to sass with threats of physical violence. It may be a bit early, but let's talk about at least this part of the villain's plan. I mean, how did Bowler Hat Guy or whoever's in charge here know that unscrewing this would result in this much carnage? Why was that even the goal? Did they really need to sabotage the entire f***ing science fair in order to get their hands on Lewis's discount reminiscence machine? The sprinklers and ensuing chaos could have easily destroyed it beyond repair, and there's no guarantee that Lewis was even going to leave it behind. Why not just steal it on or out or after the fair is finished? I call it the memory scanner. Ooh, it's shiny! It is not. Then, a laser scans the cerebral cortex. Does the laser penetrate the ear canal and arc upward to the cerebral cortex? Because the cerebral cortex is not parallel to the ear. It's up in the brain. Everyone knows that. No one needs to research to remind themselves about that. Nope. Also, why are no adults concerned about a child shooting a laser into his goddamn head? You know, at first I wasn't impressed with Lizzie's sparse fire ant colony of only 55 occupants, but when the container breaks open on the coach, there are suddenly hundreds of ants, which means amazing science f***ery is happening. That or lazy animation. Not really lazy animation. I'm so sorry. Not now. Mr. Willerstein's support and encouragement is immediately abandoned when shit hits the fan. Man, Lewis must feel totally wrecked by the crushing reality that all the blame for the creation of this dangerous machine is on him, rather than the adult that supervised him along the way. You know, this is my favorite part of kids' movies, seeing how the writers wreak havoc on a child's emotional arena. Just f*** him right up. Raid quitting your potential. You know, for someone who needed this invention to be intact and in working order, he sure doesn't give a shit about dragging the helmet along. Is Wilbur really passionate about picking up garbage? Or does he somehow know that the image on this crumpled bit of paper is important to the plot, even though he absolutely did not see what was on the page a moment ago? This movie does whatever it wants and ignores so much logic, and we haven't even gotten to the octopus butler yet. Maybe you've forgotten. I'm a time cop from the future. Should be taken very seriously. I know kids will be kids, but this is a pretty poor attempt at a fake ID, even for a 13-year-old. Come on. This looks nothing like Wilbur. Oh yeah, Captain Time Travel? Prove it! This is how Wilbur chooses to prove to Lewis that he is in fact from the future? Oh, how f***ed up is this? Let me count the ways. One, what if he'd missed? The goddamn thing is cloaked. So could Wilbur honestly be 100% certain that he was going to hit his mark? Two, we will eventually find out that he has just thrown his own damn father off this building. So why even take this risk in the first place? Three, why is it parked so low down? Best case scenario, Lewis is still permanently scarred from the three seconds of certain death freefall. Four, and finally, why not just decloak the damn time machine a few seconds earlier? Wouldn't that be a fairly convincing demonstration in and of itself? 3D printing. Movie fails to explain the chemical compounds of bubbles, which must contain a substance firm enough to support weight, but light enough to float. The truth will set you free, brother. Quoting the Bible. Hey, I'm not gonna fix that stupid memory scanner. <laughs> Wait, if they're flying right now, what did the tires just screech against? Let go! You let go! You're not the boss of me! Kids! Are you crazy? I can't fix this thing. Yes, you can. You broke it, you fix it. All right, under one condition. All right, one condition? Unless that one condition is you have to first teach me how to fix a fucking time machine, I'm calling baloney. Baloney! The time has come, I can delay no longer. These plank teeth are hideous. Premature imitation celebration. Ooh. It's shiny. It still is not. This ridiculously oversized back support. Cartoon physics be damned, I'm calling BS that this janky thing would be able to create enough tension to drag this large gentleman across this seemingly never ending table just by falling a few feet to the ground. You watch your goddamn mouth, you f lick. Disney somehow got away with using C-3PO a full five years before they bought the Star Wars franchise. Well, that was unexpected. Where in the f did the hat come from? Why would my hair be a dead giveaway? Because in this universe, people cannot control their hair with products designed to control hair. Hey, ring my doorbell. So listening a child to ring your doorbell. It says something about this film, and I'm not sure if there are people in these pots, or if it's just a head with tiny tree roots living in the entryway to the home. It also says something about the film that they never explain a goddamn fuchsia octopus, and this is the most normal part of the next five minutes. By leaving the garage door unlocked, you let the time machine get stolen, and now the entire time stream could be altered! But how would you know the difference? Wouldn't this just be your new timeline? 
Which leads me to point out that, perhaps unsurprisingly, the time travel rules in this film are never made clear. Is this a Back to the Future situation where the effects of any timeline squiffiness are gradual and happen as the decisions are being made, with said decisions creating a branching parallel timeline that you can't break out of? Or does this follow the Star Trek First Contact method, where the changes are immediate and change reality as soon as the offending time meddler has set off to the past? Or, or is it the Doctor Who school that just straight up doesn't give a tiny temporal f the point is, I love talking time travel mechanics and would be happy with any of the above, but instead the movie just says, F*** you, Jeremy, and your love of all things timey-wimey. I just want to point out that even though they are short on time, Wilbur decides to craft tiny clay people for this entire useless demonstration. What about taking him back to see his mom? I just told him that to buy some time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can't see that one blowing up in your face. The unwanted love child of Bender from Futurama and Marvin the Paranoid Android would be excellent at CinemaSense. You haven't seen any teeth around here, have you? Grandpa Bud is staring at his adoptive son without recognizing him. Maybe look for your brain before your teeth. When you calculate that this toilet is large enough to fit a grown man and a small child inside the bowl, it really makes you wonder about the person the toilet was made for. How massive their shits must be. Bouncy tea shrubbery, instant artwork gun, matriarchal marionette, disco granny, octopus butler, frog orchestra, what the f is happening? Please, your mother is trying to take a nap. Sex with your right hand resulting in children. Frog Sinatra. Taught them everything they know. So they took normal frogs and enhanced them to grow vocal cords and dexterity enough to play an instrument? Jesus, this movie is terrifying. Perfect timing, we need someone on maracas. Lewis would be the Ringo star of Orchestra Sins. Also, I did not take nearly enough drugs to watch this movie, and someone should have told me I needed meds for this one. Movie called Meet the Robinsons takes 37 minutes to actually meet all the Robinsons. Wait, do they really need to be in the dark for this? And how is Wilbur managing to light the pair of them perfectly when I can't even ring my face properly for fan hangouts? What does Cornelius look like? Tom Selleck. The fact that Lewis grows up to be Cornelius is, of course, the reason that his is the only photo missing from this discount Adams Family Rogues Gallery, but the movie doesn't even attempt to give a reason why his portrait is gone. And unfortunately, this is one of the very few occasions where invoking Tom Selleck won't save the day. Doris, get it off! Get it off! Because using your own hands to lift the windowsill isn't an option? Mr. Steak, you're my only friend. Giving a slab of raw meat to a child. Run out of frozen peas or actual ice packs? God damn, this ridiculous orphanage. Everyone will tell you to let it go and move on, but don't. Instead, let it fester and boil inside of you. Take these feelings and lock them away. Let them fuel your actions. Let hate be your ally, and you will be capable of wonderfully horrid things. And now you know the process CinemaSyn staff will use to turn the hateful comments into alchemical fuel for our next script. We will shortly find out the bowler hat guy is the adult version of young Michael here, but where the hell did this giant downturn nose come from? That's not the sort of thing that suddenly flops downward during puberty. Feels like Disney was determined to keep this twist a surprise, even at the expense of it making sense. Why choose to become invisible after very obviously flying into the yard? God, this movie is dumb. Sometimes it's hard to send animation, but then you see the anatomy of a shoe like this, and you gain the confidence to shout, how is his foot fitting in this shoe, and why does no one care? Dinner is served. Never trust food carried from the depths of robot intestines, served by tiny spawn clone robots. Never. Just a reminder that these two are Lewis's parents, and they don't recognize their son. Sure, they are old and Lewis is in a hat, but you're telling me that two people who raised a renowned inventor child genius wouldn't remember his voice or how he talks or how he walks or at base level what he looks like? When we see grown-up Lewis or Cornelius later in the film, he's even wearing clothes similar to little Lewis's clothes. The movie doesn't want Lucille and Bud to realize the truth because they're going for a shocking reveal, but the reveal is pointless if we can find so much wrong with the movie's logic. Slapping your siblings' meatballs with your bare hands. Okay, gang, time for the second Second course. How is it time for the second course when everyone's bowl of food is untouched from the first course? Also, overly extendable points of articulation aside, I finally pinned down what's so unnerving about Carl. His entire mouth looks like skin. Is this actually a human in a robot skin suit? Or for some reason did Cornelius think that the finishing touch his newly minted robot needed was the overstretched jowl of an unwitting human? I can't think about it too much. I am disturbed. My friend Lewis is an inventor. He can fix it. For a person desperately trying to hide his time-traveled kid father, Wilbur sure is making an odd decision to put Lewis firmly in the center of attention. There's a million people over there. There are not. Uncle Joe can't hold on much longer. Uncle Joe has an entire plate of spaghetti that he should eat before getting to the second f***ing course. Tell that man, baby to calm down and eat his dinner before dessert like everyone else. And if he can't behave, no screen time tonight! From failing, you learn. From success, not so much. No, you learn when you pay attention to the circumstances of your situation and choose to glean wisdom and understanding despite the outcome. There's no perfect scenario to learn from. You get to pick what to glean. Should I write kids' movies?
So we're just meant to accept the fact that no one is eating any other food? To Lewis! To, to Lewis. Lewis! It's bad enough the movie wants to shove a cornucopia of inventions down our throats, but now they demand we assume the family has a way to instantly clean their clothing of the PB&J that was on them only moments ago. What a great plan! Go back in time and steal a dinosaur! I'm all for dinosaurs in my movies, but how did he manage to bring this giant T-Rex to the future? There's no way it's fitting inside this cockpit. I suppose there could be some sort of temporal tractor beam that towed the dinosaur to the future, but, but I am getting really f***ing tired of having to invent technology on behalf of this movie in order for it to make sense. On behalf of Dr. Ian Malcolm, I'm dispensing 50 sins to account for the writers being so preoccupied with whether the Robinsons should survive this, they didn't stop to think if they could survive this. No, no, you can't eat him! Dude, you have a goddamn remote control. So why wasn't your first instruction, hey, don't eat the kid, I need him alive? You do realize this is a f***ing dinosaur, right? Just... Just out of curiosity, what, what is the dough gun normally used for? I'm having a really hard time understanding how a dough cannon is useful on a daily pizza delivery situation. And no, I'm not sending another invention, I'm sending a dough cannon. There's a slight difference. <laughs> Jurassic Parkour! This cannon is firing out a fierce amount of sausage, but where is it storing all of this ammunition? <laughs> oh look! It's the most hilarious part of the movie. And you might be wondering why you're sending the funniest part of the movie. And the answer is because it's the most hilarious part of the movie. And there should be plenty more that could have been done to make me laugh. I am the target audience, after all. Hey! <laughs> this works, and so does this. Are you boys all right? We're good, Mom. Yeah, did you see us take out that dinosaur? Do you mean the dinosaur that is sitting right here? The one that is now under nobody's control and should therefore revert to its preferred state of being a tiny brain carnivore who would probably be partial to the people picnic before him? That one? You want to be a Robinson? You... you... Wanna adopt me? And now for the movie's most alarming decisions. We see Lewis and Franny form a mother-son kinship, even though Franny is Lewis's future wife. Then moments after insisting on adopting him as her own child, the entire family immediately rejects Lewis without explanation, which triggers his abandonment issues. Emotional torture for everyone. I can't believe I was dumb enough to actually believe you were my friend. I am your friend! A lot of people in my life tell me that routine is important, so I should probably be thankful for yet another perfectly timed third act conflict cliché. And yet... I guess the message here is that the family champions for mistakes made with inventions, but not mistakes we make as people. F*** this wacky family and their oddly specific obsession with acceptable failures. All you have to do is put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And we'll take you back to find your mommy. The crossed fingers get out clause for commitments is strange to me in multiple ways. Has anyone ever actually accepted its use when being betrayed? And if the finger crosser in question's morals are so questionable, why would they even bother employing it in the first place? Eventually they closed down the orphanage and everyone left. Except me. Which means Mildred managed to close down the orphanage and overlook the abandoned child upstairs. She's the worst! Make sure you shut that door tight or else the alarm won't engage. Imagine being the most inventive family in the world and not having a door that will shut and lock itself. Or at the very least, make a beep noise when left open. F*** me. And how did Michael even know that the garage door was going to be left open? Had he really been waiting there every night on the off chance that something like this would happen? If he was going to break in regardless, then this really isn't Wilbur's fault at all. Michael was always going to steal the time machine. Hmm, let's see. Take responsibility for my own life or blame you. Ding, 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 ding. Blame you wins hands down. I don't know whether to sin Disney for reminding me that people can't take ownership for their own actions, remove a sin for highlighting its importance, or add a thousand sins for the human race in general. Since none of this is my responsibility and Disney solely is to blame, let's stick with the one sin. Look at that, boys! We're almost home cricket! At this point, I have no f***ing clue where Disney draws the line, because this shit is f***ing brutal. I don't care if Carl is eventually repaired, you just blasted a grappling hook through the heart of a lovable comic relief robot, allowed us to watch the electronic spark of life leave his eyes, and just expect that shit to not scar kids for life. I wouldn't worry too much, kids. I very much doubt that Inventco's legal team will be able to defend this contract in court if they can't even spell aforementioned properly. Also, there are no spaces after the commas in this dumb contract. I don't understand! He just wanted to ruin his future, not this! Believing a bowler hat containing an evil AI will keep its word. This can't be happening! No! Oh, Lewis. It's already happened. Lewis clues into his new present, and I feel like this is a good time to pause and state what the movie is suggesting reality to be. In this now, Lewis never invented anything, because he was taken out of his timeline and entirely missing up until now. He never had Wilbur, never met his parents, and never met his future wife. So how is anyone still assembled together in the Robinson house at all? Convenient and sudden understanding of how to drive an entirely foreign spacecraft is convenient. Take a good look around, Doris, because your future's about to change. Why didn't Lewis just travel back in time as soon as he 
as you got into the damn time machine. Why risk taking a tour of the city, giving the grabby hats a chance to attack? I am never going to invent you. Something you could have said in the previous scene while in Mortal Peril. Luce returns to the future he wants without the movie showing us that he actually returned to turn in his own invention. Meaning, whatever future is unfolding in front of us now should be a representation of the timeline that would exist without Lewis growing up or Doris taking over. It would likely be a horrible city filled with neglected children and adults working out their abandonment issues due to the real villain of the story, Mildred. Yes, I know, this is a kid's movie and they won't care about it. The point is, a time travel story can be as complicated or as simple as you make it. But right now, Disney is making Primer look like the f***ing hungry, hungry caterpillar. Goob! Goob. Lewis immediately gives up looking for Michael before even bothering to check behind one of the few places he would have had time to run to and hide. Let me fix that. There. Just a little tip for the future. I am always right. Even when I'm wrong, I'm right. She's right. I'd just go with it if I were you. Good old Disney, still teaching kids that the key to a healthy and long-lasting relationship lies in who wins the most arguments. We agreed that if you fix the time machine, I'd take you back to see your mom. What? Wilbur chooses to dump Lewis right into the most traumatic event of his life, without even a minute's warning or asking if this is something he still wanted to do. Go! Go! Wake up! What? Yes, because losing the game was the problem here, not the fact that losing resulted in hideous bullying, which then sent Michael into an understandable spiral of bitterness and jealousy. But let's fix this one isolated incident, instead of helping Michael find some actual coping mechanisms for life's inevitable letdowns. You don't look like a Lewis. You look more like, a uh... Cornelius. Hey, kid, we just met, but I don't like your name, so I suggest you change it to something super random for no good reason. Don't worry, it's all in service to these stories weaved by our benevolent mousy overlords. Kid, we'd like to get a story on you for the local paper. You've got a bright future ahead of you. What? Where the f*** did this guy come from? What's he doing at a middle school science fair to begin with? And how the hell did he know to come after everyone has packed up, but just in time for Lewis's invention to do its thing? Did the director just ad-lib the last five minutes of this film and slap the animation on to match? See that, kids? Be better at sports, and maybe, just maybe, that will make you worthy of love. Someone close that goddamn mailbox for f**k's sake! And that mailbox too! What the absolute f*** is wrong with people in this universe? More like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey stuff. <laughs>